Ask Mike, brought to you by the Stadium Shop on Razorback in Fayetteville. Happy Monday, everybody. It's another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin. This might be the Christmas edition because could Christmas be. is this week, Mike. Well, could yeah, be. could be. Maybe not. No Christmas questions. No. No. Okay. So maybe it's not the maybe holiday. We're not in edition. the holiday spirit. We're not in the holiday spirit. We actually do have a lot of spirit when it comes to asking about the Razorbacks. So let's get right into it, shall we? Our first question is from Slobber Slob, who says, "I have to admit that I panicked a little when Dow Loggins left, but not surprised. I can't see any better hire though than Morgan Turner. What do you think, Mike?" Well, we just got a chance to have a press conference with him today. So it's the first time he was in front of the media. And it looks like a good hire. Now, look, this guy's got his work cut out for him. Because when Dow Loggins left, and we talked about it last week, there were all these claims that, ooh, you got three tight end commitments that Dow brought in. You might lose at least two of them. Well, they, they've apparently lost uh, uh, Jaden Ham. Yes. Because he went to Kansas or decommitted, and it looks like he's going to Kansas. And then Shamar Easter who's from here in Arkansas, but he apparently has made a visit to South Carolina now. He wow. hasn't flipped yet, but it looks like Loggins is pulling him in there. So that would leave Luke Haas from Bixby. He's the one that Alabama's been after, and he's the one everybody's been worried about that Nick Saban would come in and pull him in. That hasn't happened either. But, you know, T Turner's got to come in and, and at least keep uh, – Luke Haas. And it looks then, like he will, though. Well, maybe. I mean, we'll hope yeah. so. But then I got to believe that he was recruiting some guys or knows of some guys out on the West Coast that he might be able to bring in here. This is the thing. When you panic about losing guys, you got to remember, remember Loggins went, went a, a, over a week ago. Now, this guy's just been announced. I do think he's been out recruiting a little bit. He said he had been. But it may take him a little longer, but don't panic about these decommitments or, you know, guys hitting the portal or whatever until this whole process is over. And we're still not to the early signing period yet. So Arkansas has some time to make up both with the new defensive coordinator they bring in and with the tight ends coach to bring in people to make up for the people they lost. But what's been going on is that people have been going nuts. So every time they lose somebody, it's like the world is coming to an end. And I'm not saying don't do that, but I am saying you at least ought to wait until this thing all breaks out and settles down. And when it's all over, really, and it's not totally over until early February, that's yeah. when we're going to really know the impact of all these changes. Yeah, and the only reason why I say about the Luke Haas stuff is because I saw on social media today their school putting out something, join us for signing day, you know, and, and they put Luke on there um, and his brother, I think, as well, and they both had little Razorbacks by yeah. their name. So... So. Doesn't mean anything, but maybe a good sign there as well. That would be well. good. And then again, hopefully he can. He might bring somebody in out of the portal. Yeah. He could bring in a, a freshman. But again, if you, as I said last week, if you, when his his name was just a rumor, if you look at how he's rated, they do ratings of, of coaches by position on the internet. You can go look them up. And his rating is much higher than Dow Loggins. Dow Loggins honestly is more of a quarterbacks coach. He mm. he just came here in that role. And I'm not saying he couldn't coach tight ends because he did a good job of developing yeah. Trey Knox. But this guy, uh, Morgan Turner, has a better reputation of developing tight ends and getting quality out of them. He sent tight ends to the NFL. Yeah, so. some pretty big names as well. And came from tight ends U. You know, they that's, talk that's, about Stanford being Stanford, tight ends Arkansas ends used to be that. <laughs> now it's Stanford. So we'll see if Arkansas goes back to being tight ends. I like U. it. I hope that's a, a real prediction there from you, Mike Irwin. Redleg asks, what is the timeline for Coach Pittman to get a new D.C. hired? <laughs> well, he has. It seems there is a perception that Pittman is somehow being stonewalled in this endeavor to find a new D.C. Yeah, this was a crazy search, and Pittman admitted some of it was on him because he wanted to wait as long as possible to make an announcement. But what happened was you had people tracking his plane. He and talked he talk about yes, that. Yes, he talked about how he really kind of had fun because he knew they were tracking his plane. So he did some <laughs> things. Like he, really where it came to head was when he went to talk to a recruit in Maryland, but then the Maryland's defensive coordinator, or maybe it was the tight end, Maryland's tight end, one of those guys got thrown out as yeah. a candidate. And he said, I felt sorry for the guy because he has to go to his head coach and explain, look, I haven't talked to Sam Pittman. 
But that's what happens with the internet. And this is mostly not media people. It's mostly these people that track them, yeah. these fans, and then they pop up and say, well, this is probably the guy. Yeah. And, and there were actually four different guys that were probably the guy, and only one of them ended up being the guy. <laughs> And so he talked about how he, when he actually interviewed uh, uh, the tight end, the, uh, the offensive yeah. coordinator, and when he actually interviewed him, he said uh, what he did was he, he didn't meet him in Orlando because no. he was Central Florida's uh, defensive coordinator. He met him in Tampa, and then he brought in uh, – he actually brought in uh, the tight ends coach because well, he, he was down there, recruiting, yeah, down there and, recruiting and brought him in. And so they were able to meet together and he said, I fooled everybody. So but, because he, he anticipated these people following his airplane. He did a good job. He did a good job. But that might not be a thing anymore, Mike, because you've heard, you know, with Elon Musk and taking over Twitter and things like well, that's that. That's just that what Musk is doing. He's just ban going he's to ban banning. He's, he's called doxing. When yeah. you when you give somebody's real time location. And it's a bigger deal in politics than it is in yeah. sports because what, what some people are claiming that in politics you're mad at somebody politically so you dox their location so that a bunch of people can show, show up and protest and yell at them and stuff like that. And, he, and Musk was saying, I'm not going to allow that anymore. And well, he banned yeah. some media people for yeah, doing and, it. Yeah, and somebody was posting his own personal jet flight right, information. Following him around and <laughs> so, so he did that. But I don't know that that's going to stop. In, mm -hmm. in football. <laughs> it's not I, quite I, as serious as politics. I think they'll find somewhere else to post that information. Yeah, maybe exactly. Facebook, maybe, I don't know, Instagram. Stu wants to know the new DC. Your thoughts on that, Mike Irwin? Okay, this is Travis Williams. Uh, first of all, watching him in the press conference, he's a young guy. Yeah. Played at Auburn, gave Gene Chizik credit for starting him out. I was thinking he might give a lot of credit to Gus Malzahn, who never said anything about Malzahn, Ooh. even though he worked with Malzahn at Auburn and then followed Malzahn to Central Florida and so was kudos his. kudos from you then. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I had anything to do with that. But he didn't mention Malzahn as having an influence over him. But he was the co-defensive coordinator. Now he becomes the co uh, coordinator here at Arkansas. Very young guy. Talked about being coaching in a very aggressive defense attack the ball is what he said. We're going to go after the ball wherever it is. I mean, that means if you're running it, throwing it, whatever, we're going to go after wherever it is. And that, that would be if your quarterback has it in his hands. We want to go after the quarterback. So he said all the right things for people that felt like, you know, that Barry Odom wasn't doing enough to go after quarterbacks. He was dropping back in coverage more, even though I explained why he was doing that, that, that a lot of people don't like that. So this guy seemed to answer all the questions. But the main thing is, and Pittman said this, and if you know anything about Sam Pittman, he will tell you the number one thing he looks for in hiring of any assistant coach is recruiting. And he said, this guy recruits. He's really good. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. Arkansas needs, because they, they've lost their star two starters at linebacker. And this guy's a linebacker's coach. So he, recruit he brought in apparently four, three four-star linebackers to UCF, had them committed, well, one of them decommitted this morning. Mm -hmm. So is he coming to Arkansas? I don't know, but if he does, the fans would be happy because you're kind of getting back at people stealing, you know, guys from you. You got to steal guys from them. So, you know, that, there's that. That's going on right now. So we'll see if 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 he's able to. If both of the either one of these guys or both of them is are able to add to this recruiting class. But I would say there's a lot of pressure on them to do that. Now they both talked about the fact. Because some people will probably say, well, why aren't they already coaching? Why don't you let this guy run the defense? Come on, it's too soon. Yeah. What he's having them do, Sam Pittman explained, is they're watching the, the tight ends coaches, watching the tight ends and, and getting familiar. And he talked about, look, this is a different offense than what I ran. Some of these tight ends have been standing there telling me what's going on so I can catch on to the terminology and all this stuff. And then the defensive coordinator, he just has to get – Sam Pittman said part of what he's doing right now is evaluating who we have so he'll know who to go after in recruiting over the next few weeks. So they're not going to coach in this bowl game. And most of them, what they're mostly doing is recruiting and then becoming familiar with the personnel. So that's what both of those guys will be doing right now. Yeah, and apparently Travis Williams has been in, you know, starting already doing that even before he was announced Yeah, you're today. the one that told me because you had a source <laughs> that he was already down there when he was at UCF mm -hmm. recruiting for Arkansas, which is fine. Yeah. And uh, so it looks like that's the number one thing was his ability to recruit. 
He said all the right things about being here. He said, oh man, the facilities. Oh. And he said, I love Sam Pittman. I'd heard about him. It was great talking to him. And uh, so uh, the press conference w re went really well. But yeah. now what they do from here on out for the next few weeks is going to have a lot to do with how fans either continue to freak out or unfreak out <laughs> on the internet. You can you can have a really good press conference, but not produce. We want to see the the real real time results of that. So I agree with you there, Mike. Pig's feet says I understand the players leaving who were encouraged to leave or were not in line for playing time. I'm completely baffled by the players leaving who have had plenty of playing time or and or in line for more playing time. Is this all about NIL money? Yes, it's not all about it, but in some in many cases it is. Uh, you, there are other coaches that have talked about this. Sam Pittman didn't address specifically whether Arkansas was going to have to buy players, but he said, I don't like to buy players. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any question that there are, this is a flagrant violation of the NIL rules. I've talked about this before. The one ba there's two basic NIL rules. One of them is you can't tie an NIL deal to performance. You couldn't tell a quarterback, we'll give you this much money you know, a business, a, a car dealership. I'll give you this much money for endorsing our cars. If you throw 10 touchdown passes, we'll give you twice as much if you throw 20. That's, that's not allowed. Yeah. As far as I know, that's not being violated. But the one rule that is being violated is you're not supposed to be able to offer either a high school senior or anybody in the portal a specific NIL deal until after they sign a letter of intent with your school. And that apparently is being violated left and right. Where is the NCAA? Why are they sitting back letting this happen? Because this amounts to the open buying of players. I've been engaging people on the internet all, the, all over this weekend who try to tell me, oh, there's, Arkansas just has to learn to adapt to this. This is going to be the new way college football is done. No, it's not. It, something will have to be done because trying to compare this to pro football, pro football does, you don't buy players in pro football, you draft them. There's a salary cap. There are p things in place in pro football to balance out the quality of, of, of athletes team to team. Now, it's never going to balance out equally. The coaching staff and the owners have a lot to do with that. You can draft the wrong people. You can coach them badly. You know, there are things like that. You can't make all teams equal. But the outright buying of players, that's not done in the NFL. And plus, people are saying, well, you, you can't cap the, the NIL because you're capping their ability to make money off their name, image, image and likeness. In the NFL, players are allowed to do their own endorsements. Yeah. They are. But in the NFL, an endorsement deal is with a company. Let's say you endorse Walmart and you're a quarterback. You're, Walmart is not paying you that because they like your team. They're paying you that because they feel like your name will help them sell more products. Mm -hmm. It's a straight business deal. But in NIL, way too often, a guy is sitting there endorsing a product of a business. That business owner is a booster. He's just using that as a way to disguise throwing money at this guy. So it's a totally different thing. And the NCAA's got to get control of this. I've said before there's a movement underway to get rid of the NCAA, at least with regard to football. I think it will happen because they're just doing nothing. They are, they are worse. The NCAA is supposed to manage college athletics for the schools. They work for the schools, and it's the other way around. They just sat back and go, hey, we'll do whatever we want. And they are absent without leave in this thing. They're just <laughs> not showing up for work. They're not a bunch of guys sitting around Indianapolis doing zip and something has to change. Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, and hopefully it does soon. Jim Reynolds asks, is it possible for the NCAA to have athletes sign a contract to play in bowl games if the team qualifies before declaring for the professional draft or entering the transfer portal? I don't think that's going to be the way to do it, but I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, again, you've got a lot of fans that anytime you talk about start re restricting athletes, they say, well, you don't restrict coaches. You can't restrict athletes. There are ways in which coaches are restricted. If I sign a contract with a school to be their head coach, there is a, a clause in that contract that specifies the penalties I, play if I pay if I opt out of that contract. So they could put this in your letter of intent, which in effect is a contract, and say, if you, if you sign this LOI for this year, you have to agree to play through the end of this, our, our, our uh, competitive season. And if you drop out or opt out or say I'm going to the NFL or say you're hitting the portal and you don't play through the end of the season, 
This is a penalty, and they will specify what penalty you have to pay. You might have to pay them back money. So they could do that. Whether they'll do that or not, I don't know. But there are ways to at least reduce the amount, the number. Because, listen, I remember when a player opting out of a bowl, it happened, but it was very rare. The idea was, you're, this is your team, hmm. you know. Kind of like what Dalton Wagner well, Dar said. Dalton Wagner, everyone should listen to what Dalton <laughs> Wagner said the yes. other day. It was incredible. Because this is a, this is a guy that's, that's been invited to the Senior Bowl, a guy that will, needs to start working out for the draft mm -hmm. and getting ready for the draft. And unlike a lot of other guys, he said, I thought about it and I decided to come back and play through the end of the season, through this bowl game, because he said, I couldn't live my, with myself if I didn't, because I'd be doing this to my teammates and the team that supported me all these years. Yeah. Why do more guys not have that attitude? Because this is all turned into, oh, I have a right to get this and I need to make a lot of money. And, and, and it's turned into, people are trying to compare it with the real business world, but I'm telling you, even in the real business world, there are curbs on things that you can do. Mm. You couldn't just go to work for a competing television station next week because nope. they offered you more money. There are, you signed a contract. A contract. <laughs> So in the real world, we don't do this, but somehow a lot of these dinged up fans think that athletes have a right to do anything they want, yeah. and they don't. Yeah, and, and it's a good point with Jim Reynolds. If it's turning into a business, right, which is where it's heading with all the NIL money and the deals and the endorsements, if it is a business, wouldn't you think you would have a contract with an athlete? Wouldn't you think yes. that they would start to say? Well, the, NI the LOI is a contract. It is. But it's they don't they don't have certain protections built in that right. probably they should. So maybe this is an answer. Maybe there are, uh, is another way to do this. Yeah. But I'm convinced that what we have out here is we have a whole maybe 80 percent of the fans. I'm going to throw out a number. I didn't do a survey. <laughs> 80 percent of the fans of college athletics love college sports because they like it. They they might follow a pro team. They might be sort of interested in in the NFL. But they're mostly college fans, and that's where their focus is. You got about 20% of these fans that they're both. I'm an NFL fan. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, or I like the Chiefs, or whatever. But I'm also a Razorback fan. And a lot of these people just want to turn college athletics into a farm club for them. I mean, they, you, you go on the Internet, and you'll read a guy say, look, I think they ought to just separate from the university that – you know, you can rent the facility that's on campus because it's already there. Rent that facility, but you just bring these, hire these kids out of high school, pay them money, just like if they went straight to a, a to a, a major league baseball farm club, and you're paying them money until you bring them up. Yeah. yeah. You know, to Kansas City or Dallas or whatever, and they, they think that would be perfectly fine. What these people are totally ignoring is what happens with 98% of the kids that are coming into the college athletic programs. They don't go pro. No. You know what they get? They get an education out of this. And if these people were in my position, where you run into somebody five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, who got a degree by through their football or their basketball, and you see them, and what are you doing these days? Well, I'm managing a Walmart, or I'm yeah. over here running a, a company we sell used cars, or I started a business. And you see these people where their college degree gave them a, a, an ability to make a living for themselves yeah. and their family. And a lot of these people just totally ignore that part of it. And that, if we ever make that go away, that other part is going to go away. Yeah. You're going to just have to go to, to school on your own. You're not going to get an athletic scholarship. And that's what they want, some of these that's people. Terrible. It's completely whacked out. They're, they're students before they're athletes. Student yes, athletes. absolutely, and right. they're going to college, and they act like they've, uh, again, it got into a discussion on, on the Internet about limiting the NIL money, and it was like, you can't tell those people how much money they can make. They don't do that to everyone else. Uh, yeah, they do. If, if you sign a contract, they're going to pay you what you agree to in that contract. <laughs> you don't have a right to just go, well, I also want to make a million dollars by endorsing this used car lot, because they won't let you do it. No. So... Athletes don't just have some automatic right to make gajillions of dollars because they're a high-profile quarterback going to college. And there are ways to limit this. I talked about it last week. You could make them part-time employees of the university, pay them all thirty-five dollars or $40,000, which is way more than a library worker would make, a student would make yeah. working in the library. But So they would have a good, comfortable way of spending. They'd have a lot of spending money. Everything else is covered. And you're going to tell me that that's bad? 
I mean, you want to talk to some of these kids that I knew who are now, they're in their 50s and 60s when I first came here, and they talk about laundry money. That was their only spending money. They got room and board, and on Sunday, the, ca the cafeteria was closed. You had an athletic dorm, and the cafeteria was closed on Sunday, so they had to go buy their own food on Sunday, wow. and they had to buy it with the laundry money they got. <laughs> so what do you do about your laundry? You don't, you don't have any money for no. laundry. No. So, and I, I talked to a guy about this. Now, I'm not going to say who he was because he didn't give me a permission to use his name, but he went to the NFL. Wow. And he said, you know what? He said, I loved every minute of it. It didn't ever occur to me that I was being taken advantage of because I wanted to play football. We lost that somehow. Yeah, we definitely have. Uh, well, Marty Bird's proxy wants to know, can you opine on the future of bowl games in particular after playoff expansion? There seems to be less interest than there once was in these games. It appears players are making their next move before the bowls gutting a lot of teams. He makes a good point there. I was going to bring that up in our last discussion. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure what you do about this. Um, we, we just talked about the previous question. Is there a way to make them stay? It, it, it isn't in place right now. And so how does it affect the bowl games? Well, the bowl games are still out there. I, I do think it, it decreases the interest in these bowl games. Um, and so what's the answer? Well, I think the answer is we're rapidly reaching a point where the, where the value of a bowl game is just the extra practice mm -hmm. and the ability. Look what's happening with Arkansas right now. They're actually playing a lot of guys that were going to, going to be a factor mm -hmm. next year. So they're, they're able to look at certain guys and say, is this our linebacker next year? Is this yeah. one of our wide receivers? So there's a value in that. It's getting these guys extra uh, work going into spring football. So it gives them a little bit of a head start. And then these two, two new coaches both said, if Arkansas wasn't in a bowl game right now, we wouldn't be able to do any player evaluations right yeah. now. I would just have to sit and look at stuff on video. <laughs> and he said, they both said, there's no substitute for being able to watch these guys work out and start forming in your mind, okay, what do I have at the tight end position? Okay, what do I have on the defense? So there, I think if anything, if nothing else, at least these bowl <laughs> games will we'll allow schools to do this. And, you know, I, don't, I can't tell you how much, how it, I think the interest in bowl games is going down every year. Every year. Because of all this stuff we're talking about. I've seen a, a, at least one bowl game where one team was devastated by all these opt-outs and the other team wasn't and they just beat the snot out of this team. Yeah. So it makes it less competitive. So it's definitely affecting the interest, the TV interest in it, but I think there's always going to be a reason to play a bowl game. Yeah, and there's so many bowl games out there. If you take some of them away, if you give less chances for teams to be in all these bowl games, I think maybe that might increase the interest as well. Maybe, but then you take away the value of those teams that get into those That's bowl true. games. There's That's just true. there's a, there's a reason beyond the game to to go to get a bowl selection. For believe sure. me. For sure, I definitely believe you. Roadhog82 says I've heard a few different explanations as to why the Little Rock basketball games aren't televised or streamed. Can you give an explanation that makes sense? Thanks. Yeah, it's it's a multi part problem. You can start with the fact that Simmons Bank Arena is not set up for streaming like an ESPN3 game, okay? You can't do that. ESPN3 can't stream the game because they don't have the facilities. All right, so now you talk about, well, okay, well, why can't a network type come in there? Or yeah, like e a truck. Or ESPN, ESPN do ESPN or ESPN2 or ESPN3 where they bring in their own truck. Okay, that's going to take a higher profile type game. A good example of that would be uh, Alabama played Gonzaga last Saturday, I think it was, on CBS. So CBS went into Birmingham. Not, it wasn't played on Alabama's campus. It was played on Birmingham inside the state, but not at their facility. So this would be a very similar comparison to Simmons Bank Arena. But CBS just brought their own people in there. Why? Because this was... You know, this was Alabama, which was a top 10 team against Gonzaga, which was a top 10 team. So it was worth them to do the money. So, okay, why, why doesn't Arkansas do that? This is why, because if Arkansas is going to play a game like that, you know what they're going to do? They're going to play it at Bud Walton Arena yeah. because they make so much more money yeah. off of a game there. You, you got a greater capacity, so you got more sales. You don't have to pay a, a rental fee. A fee. 
you don't you get all the parking revenue. Arkansas doesn't get parking revenue. Yeah, At Simmons true. Bank, you get all of the concession revenue. So there's just there's a lot more money to be made off of a high-profile game at Bud Walton, so they're not going to put that game in North Little Rock. So now we get to the last part, well, why even have it there? Because you've got to understand why they're doing this. They're doing it because they want to give Central Arkansas people who can't come up here and go to games a chance once a year to do what? To bring your kids out and yeah. let you watch a game and enjoy yourself. I mean, I have heard stories from people in Central Arkansas uh, I, I've, I've gone on the internet and had people write about it on Facebook. I went to a game in North Little Rock when I was 13 years oh. old and it was the first time I ever saw Arkansas and I've been an Arkansas fan ever since. This is why Arkansas wants this. They want Central Arkansas kids that are growing up and their parents to enjoy this. And what happens here is you've got all these other people that can't watch the game, one game out of 30 plus on television who are saying, this is terrible, I, I have a right to watch this game. I t all I can tell you is what I did. I listened to Phil Elson do the women's game because it wasn't on TV from Creighton, mm -hmm. and that was a top 10 matchup of two yeah. teams. Or, well, Creighton was, I'm sorry, Creighton yeah. was 16, 16 Arkansas 21. was 20, whatever. And it was a great game, and I listened to Phil Elson, he did a great job. Then as soon as that was over, I listened to Chuck Barrett and Coach Z, you know, do the game from uh, Simmons Bank Arena, and they did a great job, and I enjoyed it, and I didn't feel unprivileged at yeah. all. And you then know. you watch the highlights on Picture All Nation. Yeah. <laughs> I watched uh, Will's, the stuff Will shot. I, yeah. I, they put a picture of you on the internet over there <laughs> by your computer looking weird. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mike. That's great. <laughs> and so it was all cool. <laughs> it was. It was all cool. We had a great time. And I, I actually do like that they do a game over there. After Did you not think the people it, had a lot of fun being there? It was so much fun. The energy was great. The, the team was fired up. Coach Muss was fired up. They signed autographs. I they think did. the day before they, they went to Children's Hospital. They did. They did that. They went to Benny Hanna's and people were excited to see them out at Benny Hanna's. It was great. It's just trying to argue that you shouldn't play that game is just idiotic in my opinion. Yeah. There's, it may not be benefit you personally, but don't be so <laughs> Dadgum selfish. <laughs> we, the Razorbacks are, are a, a state of Arkansas team, and you've got to reach out to the entire state. I agree completely with that statement, Mike. How do you say this guy's name? Rogner? Roger, Rogner? Rogner asks? I'm not sure because this is the first time he's put a question. Okay, in. well, I hope I didn't and mess it up. I don't know him. Or okay. Her. Could be a her. We don't know. We don't know, but I'm going to go with Rogner. Ask, why does the university promote the off campus games so much more than the NWA games? From Coach Moss to Hunter Juracek, the NWA ticket holders are made to feel like second class fans. Very sad that our flagship university has split the fan base. This wide. is a, every once in a while you get a question that I'm not sure I can answer that because I'm not sure what I, I understand the question. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I am not aware of the fact that the university uh, publicizes the one game a year in North Little Rock more than other games. First of all, if you talk about publicizing, we've got newspapers, radio, internet, TV, and what other kind of media? There's all kinds social of social media. Social media. It's all over the place. Yeah. There's no game that's ever played that is not publicized. Mm -hmm. uh, is one of them publicized more than the other? Maybe the week that a game is played at Simmons Bank because it's only once a year. Maybe the athletic department makes a little bit more of an effort to make sure everybody knows. But that's just because it's a one-time thing, and they want people. Hey, it's here. Be sure and go out there because they do want to fill the game the arena up for that game. Maybe and it that, was sold out, too. Yeah. And, and, and so if that's why they're doing it, that's why, because it was sold out. But I don't get the impression that the games that are played in Northwest Arkansas are, are, are not publicized. Have you ever felt that? Like no. nobody knows I, that they're... I don't feel that way because every time I open my social media, Coach Muss is tweeting something. Yeah. He tweeted something today about their game this week. He said, hey, wouldn't it be a great Christmas present to come see the Razorbacks play at Bud Walton Arena this week? Maybe he's not really expressing this in a way that we understand. <laughs> it almost sounds like, you know, some of these complaints about games shouldn't go to Little Rock. They should be here and we should we should get more out of our money and they've added, okay. they've, they've jumped the cost and all that. There's a lot of complaints about what the athletic department has done in the way of ticket prices for baseball and who they let sit where. 
but I don't, I don't really understand that question because I don't. It's never been my impression that games are underpublicized in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, me either. But uh, maybe maybe we're just reading the question wrong. Hot Dogger says you listed your top recruiting coaches for football last week. Do you think that Moss is the best basketball recruiter for the Hogs? That's a really good question. I really yeah. had to think about it a lot, and um, this may be a little controversial because I love Nolan, but honestly. Ooh. When I look at it, Ooh. maybe Muss, I would call him one and Nolan one A. And only, and look, you got to separate recruiting numbers where you rank with what you do with it. Because Nolan won, uh, Nolan went to three, three Final Fours, won a national championship, and was a national runner up. Muss hasn't done any of that yet. So I'm not trying to put Muss ahead of Nolan. But if we're strictly talking about recruiting, I don't think Nolan ever had three McDonald's All-Americans in one class. I don't think he ever think he had the number two recruiting class in the country, although I don't follow recruiting enough to know that. There may be some gurus out there that can tell me I'm wrong on that. But if it's strictly recruiting and you look at who he's got lined up coming in, who he's working on to bring in next year, I would say he's probably number one. Okay. And Nolan's 1A. And then I'd give Eddie Sutton's three, but Sutton's kind of back there a ways because these two guys <laughs> could really recruit. Yeah, they really can. Lawson Swine wants to know, has Van Horn gotten past the time when his recruits for the number one class of 2023 can be poached by the MLB? And did we lose anyone to the draft? Well, he must be talking about last year's draft because they yeah. haven't had this year's draft. So I'll say <laughs> I think they lost two. I think I remember yes, that. They lost yeah, two. I think you're Which right is good. That. How are we past the time when they get poached? No. The better you recruit, the more likely you're going to have Major League Baseball get a first round draft, a second. You get, you get drafted in the first round, they're going to throw huge numbers at you. It's very, very rare for a first round pick out of high school not to accept the money and go into the minor league system. So you're never, I don't think you're ever going to get past that. But what a guy like Dave Van Horn has to do is he has to sit down with these guys and explain to them, look, Okay, they're offering you this amount of money, but if you come in and, and play for us for two years, this is the kind of money you can make. And there are guys that have done that, and they show, okay, this is what they offered him out of high school. This is what he actually made when he signed. And with NIL money. And with they can NIL, make some money. NIL money. That's right. So I, I think it, it helps. All of that helps. And, and Dave Van Horn is very good at it, but I don't think we're ever going to get past the point where you can say they don't get anybody. You know, you just can't do it. I mean, that's yeah. a totally different deal from, from recruiting in other sports. This is a direct, you can go directly from high school into a minor, into a major league baseball program in one step. You don't do that. It can happen in basketball. It's very rare. It's much more common in baseball. And uh, it, it doesn't happen, you know, in basket. It, it doesn't happen in, in football. Yeah. Because the N NFL doesn't want guys straight out of high school. No, definitely not. Razor Alex 88 says devastated about Mike Leach's passing. He was a precious gem to the college football world, and there was there most likely won't be anyone like him. I honestly don't remember a time when the college football world was rocked and united in support. Of Coach Leach, I agree with that. Yeah, so this has sort of surprised me. Mike Leach was a little bit controversial in some of his stops, especially at Texas Tech. Uh, I certainly always liked him. Yeah. There were, I'm telling you, he got attacked at various times. They ran him out of Lubbock. You got to remember that the administration at Tech fired him and didn't even pay him his buyout. So I always viewed him as somewhat controversial, but I also viewed him as somebody I really liked. And what I didn't realize and what shocked me is the outpouring of support, not just from the fans at schools where he had coached, but when you get Ole Miss fans virtually crying on the Internet, talking about and this is their arch rival, Mississippi State, and they're just saying, we, we wish this hadn't happened. We wish we had him back. We liked playing you guys. We liked yeah. him. And you had Lane Kiffin with this astonishing statement where he said, I didn't like losing that Egg Bowl. But knowing now that I allowed that losing that Egg Bowl allowed him to go out a, a winner in his career and get his first Egg Bowl win, he said, "I gladly give that up." And Ooh. that's that's a terrific admission from yes. a, from a yeah. rival coach. So that part of it has really surprised me. I didn't know that he had that much universal support, and yeah. it's it's been fun to watch. Yeah. I'm not sure I've ever seen anything like it. No, me either. It's it's been cool to look at social media and see all the people you know tell their stories 
and we have a question about your stories coming up, and it is our final question of the show. J.B. Carroll asks, your personal thoughts on the passing of Mike Leach in his life and career, including any firsthand or secondhand stories, and I know you got some, Mike. Well, I got one, um, <laughs> and it goes back to the buddy I always talk about that I grew up with who was the only Razorback fan in my hometown, and uh, he's... We went, to, we went through high school, uh, school together, all the way through high school. We went to North Texas State to together, and then he went back to Lubbock. And I eventually ended up here, and he's now a huge Texas Tech fan. I'm more Arkansas now, <laughs> so we kind of switched. But we always both liked Mike Leach, mm -hmm. mainly because of what he did, that great game. I think we talked about it last week in 2008. Yes, we did where, talk where about Texas, it. Arkansas, uh, <laughs> Texas Tech finally beat Texas, and he, I was on the phone with him, and he was ahead of me, and he could... He saw it happen, and I'm hearing it, and I'm yelling at him what happened, and he's going, just watch. And I, I got to watch that happen. So he knew how we both felt about Mike Leach. Well, um, Alyssa Orange, and I talked about that. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Orange and I, it was back when Brett Bielema was the head coach here. We went down to Starkville to cover a Arkansas-Mississippi State basketball game. And we're driving to Starkville, and she mentions how mummy and how she became friends with him when she was working in Abilene, because he was coaching in Abilene at that time. And mentioned all this stuff about Mike Leach. She knew I was started talking about Mike Leach and Mummy and all this stuff. And she said, well, let's call Hal. And she calls him up and tells him we're on the, he said, hey, I'm going to be in Starkville later on today. I'm recruiting a high school player there. So we agreed to meet, and he bought us this great steak dinner. Oh. People say that they don't have good restaurants in Starkville. <laughs> this was a very good restaurant. That sounds good. And then we went back to the hotel afterward and sat around and talked about Mike Leach stories. And, he, oh, and, and Mummy is a big Alamo fan because he was born in San Antonio, and I've been an Alamo. I'm one of the Davy Crockett generation fans. And we're talking about the Alamo and arguing about very, various Alamo stories. And she gets bored, and so she goes up and goes to sleep in her room, but I stayed there till past midnight talking to him about Mike Leach, about the Battle of the Alamo, about a million other things. So I called my buddy after that and talked talk to him about, because he likes Leach, and we, I shared the conversation that I'd had with Hal Mummy about Leach, and he told me all these Mike Leach stories. A lot of them are coming out now on the Internet, and he appreciated that. So uh, then... Not long after that, Bielema got fired, and Alyssa, I went to Alyssa, and I said, because they thought they were going to get Malzahn. Okay. And then Malzahn used that, that whole thing That's to get right. himself a better yeah. contract, so suddenly they got, what are they going to do now? So I said to Alyssa, well, let's find out about Leach. Maybe he would want to come in. Ooh. So she calls Mummy. Mummy talks to Leach. Mummy gets back to Alyssa and says, he wants to talk. Now, I don't know what to do with that, but I went Whoa. to one of the associate ADs, and remember, we didn't, Jeff Long had been fired, so you have Julia Cromer's People Schmeeples as the, <laughs> as the acting athletic director, so I don't know her, but I did know one of the associate ADs, and I saw him at a basketball game, and I just passed it on. Hey, Mike Leach wants to call him. So he said, okay, I'll pass it on. Well, then they ended up hiring Chad Morris. So after that was all over, I asked him, what happened? And he goes, uh, she didn't even call him. Because she called Texas Tech and they didn't give him a good reference. So I called my buddy and no. told him told him about that, so he knew all about that. So several years go by, and I'm approaching my 70th birthday. And apparently he's in Lubbock and he sees in the newspaper where Mike Leach is coming in to do a book signing because he'd written a book on Geronimo uh, when he was at Washington State, the history professor there, he and I, those two guys got together and, and co-authored a book on Geronimo, the Indian warrior. And from Leach's standpoint, it was a bo more about his strategy as a leader and how, how it applies to, to football, not, not, you know, getting into massacres and well, things, well, but, hopefully the, not. but the way Geronimo led his people, very similar to the principles of football, and that's the whole purpose of the book. So he decides to go out there and get a copy of that and send it to me for my birthday and get it signed. He said he got there, and there was a line that was an hour and a half long, and he said, man, I thought about leaving, but I said, no, I'm going to do this for you. So he stands in line for an hour and a half. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Okay. He goes up to Leach. He starts telling him, here's the book, and he starts telling him, hey, uh, I, I want you to sign this book for my buddy. He, he covers the Razorbacks, but he knows how Mummy, and he and Al Mummy talk about the Alamo and all this stuff, and he said, Leach just went nuts. Oh, yeah. I know all about that. Yeah, he talks about the Alamo all the time, and Leach just starts gabbing and going off in all these directions and telling these mummy stories. 
And my buddy's starting to get nervous because there's people behind him that want the, they're having to stand in line. And he said he tried to opt out of the conversation. Well, thank you very much. And he just kept talking because that's the way Mike Leach is. Love and that. he said, finally, I said to him, well, we've got other people that want to, want to get the book signed, but I appreciate it. So he walked away, but he said as he walked away, Leach yelled at him and said, tell your buddy that you, he's got a really good friend in you. And I agree with that. I do. Wow. And uh, this right here is the book. Oh, and there's a, uh, right here wow. is where he signed it. Oh my God! So that is one of my prized possessions. Oh, and it says Happy 70th. Yeah, to Mike, too. Happy 70th, Mike Leach, and believe me, I'm never letting go of this book. Yeah, that's a special one right that's, there. That's special. So that's my Mike Leach story. That's a great story. Way Mike. too long, but it's my Mike no, Leach story. No, it's not way too long. It was great. A perfect way to end the show today. Thank you so much for watching this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.